At some point on your journey of looking after your house and general property maintenance, you're probably going to be faced with the task of doing something connected with your doors. And I figured in this video, I'm going to explain the full anatomy of a UK door frame, how it all works, what all the different bits are called. And by the end of this video, hopefully you will know the answer to that age old question. What's the difference between a door frame, a door lining and a door casing? Quick reminder of what all the bits are called, just so you don't forget. The head is basically the top section. Hiya folks, welcome back to the show and we'll get straight into it on this one because there's quite a lot I want to show you. This is a very typical door and door lining in a 1920s property. So this is like a hundred year old house. Nothing has really changed over the last hundred years, but essentially the bits that are going to be on view in a typical property, obviously we've got the door itself, we've got the door lining, and then we've got the architrave over the top of it. And the architrave kind of hides all the gaps and tidies everything up, but we'll show you that in a minute. So it can look a bit complicated when you're looking at all these different bits here, like what is what, what's attached to what, how does it all work, what does it all do? But it's really quite straightforward. And as I say, I'll show you on a door that's currently being built in a minute and you can see exactly how it's all put together. But basically we've got down the side here, this part of the door is known as the jam. It's kind of the legs of the door frame, if that makes sense. And then at the top, the horizontal bit is known as the head. And then normally your architrave would just sit kind of on top of the jam, but here, this little rebate that we've got coming back, it's known as a quirk. And if you remember back on old videos, I'll include a link to when I was sorting all the doors out. And for one reason or another, what we've decided to go for is what's known as a double quirk. It looks a little bit fancier and uh, yeah, there's various technical reasons why we ended up going down that route. I'm not gonna cover that in today's video, but this little recess back here between the architrave and the jam is called the quirk. And as I say, we've got a double quirk here. That's not very common. And then the next bit along here is known as the stop or the door stop. And that's the bit that stops the door from swinging all the way through the frame. If you imagine when the door opens and closes without that, there would be nothing to stop the door from just going and swinging all the way through the other side. This particular door stop on this door is really, really wide. That's not particularly common. Again, this is an older house and it just happens to have a really, really wide door stop on it. The door stops are normally much, much narrower. Again, I'll show you that in a minute. Generally speaking, the stop is a separate piece of wood to the jam, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes that is the same piece of wood as that and this front section has just been notched out. In that case, it would get known as a door casing rather than a door lining. So that's the difference. A door lining has loose door stops and a door casing, the door stops are part of the same physical piece of wood. So in other words, if you ever wanted to reverse the door on a normal door lining, you could just unnail the stops and then put your door on the other way and then refit your stops in the correct position so that the door could open outwards rather than inwards. But if you're dealing with a door casing where that is physically the same piece of wood, then that is almost impossible to do because you would have to cut down this edge to cut the door stop off effectively. But the crux of it is, is that the door stop is there simply to stop the door from going all the way through the frame. It literally stops the door, hence the name. So if we head through into this room here, where we're currently building the door frame from scratch, but basically what we've got here is the kind of the builder's opening of the doorway. So this is just a very kind of rough size. It's deliberately bigger. You'll see why it's bigger in a minute. In this particular example, this is just a wooden partition wall. So that means that the door lining is gonna be fitted straight into this wood, but you might equally be dealing with a blockwork wall or a brick wall. Either way, it's more or less the same thing. It's just a rough opening that the door frame's gonna sit inside. And then what we do is we typically buy a ready-made door lining set. So for example, this door lining set here, 
is designed for a two foot three door. But in order to fit a new door into this opening, we need the lining that we attach the hinges and all the hardware, all the locks, so everything like that gets attached into this bit here. So effectively what we do is we just plonk that in this gap. And this is kind of the really important bit where we need to make sure everything's perfectly level and square. If you find that you've got a door that kind of closes by itself or you've got massive gaps around your door or whatever, it's probably because the door lining is wonky. It could also be that the hinges have been fitted on the wonk as well, but it's more likely in older houses that things have just settled out a little bit and yet the lining itself has just gone a little bit out of plumb or out of level at the top. But either way, with this being a brand new door lining that we're putting in, it's essential that we get this absolutely perfect. And that's the reason why we have the gaps down both sides. We've deliberately not made this opening exactly the right size because we want to have a little bit of wiggle room so that we can bring the jams like in or out. These aren't always perfectly straight. So we'll use little packers and things behind them just to make sure that once the door is sitting inside the lining that you don't end up with like weird gaps around the edges and things like that. Another thing I'll check as well is just that we're square. So that is also really important. If you're not perfectly square, then you'll end up having to trim little bits off your door to get your door to actually fit into the lining correctly. But if you get all this correct, your door will just fit in and you'll not have to trim your door at all other than maybe a little bit off the bottom to account for whatever floor covering you've got. And generally, by the way, when it comes to fitting your door, if you do need to trim your door, you're generally better to trim off the bottom than off the top. There's a lot of doors that tell you expressly not to trim anything off the top. Now, obviously, once you've got the door lining all level and plumb and perfect, you're gonna be left with this gap all around the edges. And that's basically what the architrave's for. Here's a piece of architrave here. And the architrave just covers up that gap like that. So that essentially means that the only visible part of the lining is going to be this little corner bit here. I mean, obviously there'll be parts of this side face here, but most of this edge will be covered up by the architrave. But what it does mean is before we fit the architrave, it's a good idea to make sure that that's all nice and smooth. Give it a bit of a sand down, maybe a very, very slight ease over of that corner so you haven't got like a really sharp corner on there. But you don't need to sand all the way back to here because as I say, it's, it's mostly covered by the architrave. I normally leave about a five millimeter quirk. So remember the quirk is where we set the architrave back a little bit. Not sure if you can see, but for example, at the top there, it would be like that. And in the UK, the way we typically do it is we mitre this corner, but other parts of the world don't necessarily do that. Sometimes, uh, for example, in the States, what you often have is this is overrun and you have kind of a butt joint at the top and then the architrave coming down the front. I don't think you call it an architrave in the States. Uh, I've completely forgotten. The name of it has completely dropped out of my head, but let us know down in the comments in your part of the world, what do you call this? The thing that we call the architrave, what do you call your bit? But anyway, as I say, the main thing that I'm trying to get across here is that before you fit the architrave, you wanna make sure you've got a nice edge about five millimeters in. Anything past that, for example, I don't know if you can see, there's a bit of damage at the top there. You'll not see that, but you will see this little corner. So I will put a little bit of filler on that before we fit the uh, architrave. Now, I want to talk about the door liner in a little bit more detail because if you go onto a DIY website to buy a door frame, then you're going to be presented with 10,000 different options. And if I kind of explain how all of that works, then hopefully it'll make your life a little bit easier. The best thing to remember when fitting a new door opening like this, you really need to work backwards from the door itself, whatever door you've chosen to buy. The door that we're using here is 686 millimeters wide and 1,981 millimeters tall. And the first thing that you're probably gonna think is, 
why the really weird measurements? And the answer is it all harks back to imperial measurements. So this is a two foot three inch wide door and a six foot six inch tall door. In the UK, we're still in this ridiculous halfway house of imperial and metric. There's loads of stuff in the UK. You might think the UK is a metric country. It is not. There are so many things that are still measured in imperial. But if you're a regular viewer of the channel, you will know I am making a sustained effort to only use metric measurements, hence the Gosforth Handyman tape measure, which is only in metric, metric on both sides as well. And what difference it makes when Half of the measurements on your tape measure aren't completely redundant, by the way. Anyway, so yeah, 686 wide, 1981 tall. Oh, and it's also worth mentioning the thickness of the door as well. This is a 35 millimeter thick door. The doors come in all sorts of different thicknesses, so that is something we're gonna have to consider later on as well. So when you buy a door lining set like this, and you don't have to buy it as a set, you can make your own, but generally it's kind of easier to just buy one. These typically come as a package with kind of everything that you need. So we've got the head, we've got the vertical rails or the jams or the legs, and then we've got the stops as well. And as I say, this pack comes with everything. So the head of the door liner comes with these trenched cuts in it. This is known as a trenched head. And it basically means that your jams slide into the head in exactly the correct position. If you don't have the trenched head, then you're gonna to have to work out the width yourself. But because on the kits that you buy, it's pre-trenched, then you don't have to think about that. That is the size that it needs to be for a 686 door. And because we want a little bit of clearance around the door, it means that it's gonna be a little bit wider. And this one, let's have a look. It's pretty much 690. And that just gives a couple of mil clearance either side and hopefully means you don't have to actually trim the door itself down. Now these heads with the trenched cuts in, you'll often see that you've got two trenched cuts. You've got one on one side and one slightly further along on the other side. And all you do is reverse the head if you've got a different sized door. So for example, this lining kit is designed for either a 686 door or a 762 door. So as long as your door that you've bought is either 686 or 762, you know this is the correct kit for it. But then the next thing we need to consider is the width of the door liner and the thickness of the door liner. Because again, depending on what door liner kit you buy, that could vary. And this is another area where we get into this quirky thing in British construction where we're going to be referring to either nominal measurements or actual measurements. I'm not going to get into the difference between that in this video or why the two exists. All you need to know is that the nominal measurements are wrong and the actual measurements are right. For example, with this door liner kit, it's advertised as being 138 millimeters wide and 32 millimeters thick but that's the nominal size, that's not the actual size. It's actually 27 and a half millimeters thick and it came as 132 millimeters wide, not 138. Now in this instance, the width doesn't matter too much because we've ripped it down anyway to 114 millimeters, which is the exact width of the wall from that surface of plasterboard to the surface of plasterboard on that side. But the main thing is if you're buying a door lining, make sure it's too big rather than too small. If it's too small, you're stuffed. If it's too big, you can always rip it down to the correct size. So I'm at the stage with this particular door lining where I'm ready to attach this into the opening. So I'm gonna be screwing through the sides and through the top to hold it all in place nice and securely. And as I say, I'll be using various spacers and packers down the edges so that it doesn't move around. But one of the things that I can consider now is where am I gonna put the fixings to minimize the amount of filling that I'm gonna to have to do. But there's a sneaky way of doing it, and that is that you put all the fixings underneath the doorstop. So if you imagine the doorstop's gonna be going there, well, I wanna make sure that all the fixings holding the frame to the wall are behind this so you don't see them. So basically the door is gonna be going on this edge here, 
So if you imagine that's going to be the edge of the door and we talked about it earlier, but we know that the door is 35 millimeters wide. So the door's going to come up to about there, but then we're going to have the stop. So the door is going to hit the stop. So the stop's going to go kind of there. So all I'm going to do is a little mark down both sides like that. Our safe point for putting fixings is going to be anywhere down here. And by the way, I always nail the stop on. I never screw the stop on. The reason being that if you ever decide at a later date you want to reverse the door or you want to change the stops for whatever reason, like a stop gets damaged or something like that, then if it's nailed on, you can always take the stops back out. But if you've got screws holding this in, the screw heads are covered with filler, then you're going to have a much harder time getting the stops off. And also remember what I said earlier, that if it's a casing set rather than a door lining set, then these stops will be the same physical piece of wood as the vertical jams. And it means then you can't really easily remove the stop. Anyway, with all of that in mind, I'm going to get this lining permanently attached into the wall. I'm going to be using quite big uh, five by 70 screws going through here, counterboard in so that they're not getting in the road of the stop. And as I say, the main thing here is that everything's nice and plumb, level at the top and nice and square. So before I fit the rest of the fixings up the jams, and I've already fixed it at the head, all I've got at the moment is two screws, one there and one there. I've checked that these are nice and plumb, both in that plane and that plane. So theoretically, if they're both perfectly plumb, we shouldn't have a problem. But what I do want to just double check is that we've got the same width between here and here as we have at the top. And if you remember, that was 690. So I'm just going to double check that. We are actually very slightly out. So we're kind of 69, probably 692 or thereabouts. So I'm going to have to change the spacer that I've got behind this, either this screw or this screw. So I'm just going to double check with my square from the top to check which side's out because one side must be out slightly. Mm, there's really not a lot in it. It is so close. But all I'm going to do is I'm going to add two millimetres on this side here. So a couple of one millimetre spacers in. Double check that. 690, perfect. And then finally, obviously you're going to be left with a great big gap down here. And that is a prime spot for sound transmission between, in this case, uh, this downstairs loo and the utility room. So I do like to fill this gap. I'm just using FireMate uh, intumescent sealant. It works really well as an acoustic sealant. It's not for anything relating to structural strength or anything like that because the screws that are in are plenty strong enough but as I say it just helps with sound transmission otherwise you've literally the only thing between this side and the other side is two pieces of architrave it's just fresh air straight through this gap so it's worth mentioning as well that the intumescent sealant it's not a construction adhesive it doesn't work like a glue it doesn't really set it's like a semi setting type of compound so don't use this instead of construction adhesive if you're not getting a good fixing with your screws for example if you're into a brick wall or something like that sometimes in older houses the screws aren't enough on their own and you might want to put a bit of extra construction adhesive behind the lining but intumescent sealant ain't construction adhesive. It's not going to glue anything. It's just going to help to stop any sound transmission through the door frame.
So with this particular project, the hinges are going to go on this side. So the hinges would literally go on there like that, obviously further down. The one thing that's worth showing you with the hinges, if you look at the back of the hinge, you will find that one side has a little opening at the top and bottom and one side doesn't. And the side with a little opening is the side that you normally put on the door edge. So this side attaches to the frame, that side attaches to the door. Now this is really a personal preference thing, but a lot of people would fit the stop at this point, but I prefer to fit the stop after the door's been fitted. And one of the main reasons from my perspective is that I like to use a router to route the rebate for the hinge recess when that goes on there. And it's really awkward getting a router in once you've got the door stops in place. So I'll do all of the routing of the hinge rebate before the stop goes in. This will be literally one of our last jobs. And then, as I say, I'll nail this in place. And then that way, if you ever need to reverse the door or you need to take the stop off for any reason, you can. If you're struggling to get a stop off your door, it's probably because it's either been screwed in or, as I say, it's a door casing where the stop is part of the actual lining. And then the opposite side is where we would fit the keep for the door latch and then the latch will go into the door itself. This is a tubular latch that we're going to be using. So that will go into a recess on there and then when the door shuts it hits that little bit of metal there and just clicks closed. So we've got new flooring to fit in here and it's going to be much easier to fit the new flooring before the door's fitted. So we'll get all the flooring done, we'll get the stops fitted, we'll do all the final bits of fillering and painting, get the architraves on and then I'll show you it once it's all finished. Now I don't often use nails in projects because generally I don't want stuff to fall apart but nails do still have their uses and for a project like this for the stops I'm just using oval nails like this. Uh, I honestly couldn't tell you if this is the correct size but these are about 40 millimeters long. The key thing with oval head nails if I just demonstrate on this scrappy bit of leftover pallet wood is that if you drive them with the head, so the, the long end of the oval, let me draw it. So imagine this is the head of the nail and it's a kind of oval shape. The grain on the wood is going in that direction. And if you run the head of the nail parallel to the grain on the wood, it's much less likely to split the wood. If you use either a round nail or you use an oval nail, but do it that way, it's probably going to end up splitting the grain of the wood. So that's why I prefer oval head nails for a job like this. And then after the nail is hammered all the way home, I just use a little nail punch tool like this just to hammer the head below the surface and then I can put a little bit of filler over the top. This stop from Wix was banana shaped so I'm just gradually forcing it back to straight by following the lines I drew on the jams earlier. I then hammer the nails home once everything's sitting nicely. And folks, that is the door frame all completely fitted, all the architraves on, all filled, primed, corked, 
And then we've just done a top coat of white satin, which is what we generally use these days, water-based white satin paint. Hopefully that now all makes a little bit more sense as to how a very typical UK door frame works. I'll just show you as well, I've put all the hardware on. There's gonna be a separate little video about the latch and a couple of tips surrounding that. But just to show you that it all kind of closes and does what it's supposed to do. A quick reminder of what all the bits are called, just so you don't forget. The head is basically the top section of the door frame. Remember that has the little recesses either side. And then that joins on to the jams or the legs that kind of glue into the little rebate at the top of the head. The architrave is this decorative piece that goes on to cover up the gap between the door frame and the wall. The bit that physically stops the door from going all the way through and out the other side is of course called the stop. And the little recess between the frame and the architrave, so we recess the architrave just up very slightly. I normally do it by about five millimeters, but that is called the quirk. Obviously, this is just UK terminology, generally speaking, and you'll probably find different parts of this get called different names in different parts of the UK. But from where I am, this is relatively standard. It would be really useful reference for everyone watching the channel if you could tell us what these parts of a door frame are called wherever you are in the world. And also, obviously, let us know where you are in the world as well. Now, I did promise you I would tell you the difference between a door lining, a door frame and a door casing. I haven't really got a clue. So I went to the Oracle that is my father-in-law. He's a retired time serve joiner. And as far as I'm concerned, what he says goes. So I asked him, what is the difference between a door frame and a door lining? And he said, my take is a door frame is ready made to fit into an opening and a door lining is built up of lining such as six per one, then door stops added, etc. Basically both the same. I also asked him his opinion on quirks around the edge of door frames and he said, what's a quirk? He did say it was a kind of pointless discussion because you could literally drive 10 miles down the road and people would call everything something different to what you just called it. I then informed him that he was in a position to set the record straight once and for all, at which point we got distracted looking at his new motorbike. So the crux of it is, I don't think there's really any right and wrong on the subject. If you go into a shop and ask for a door frame, they're gonna know what you're talking about. You should probably say it's a door lining. If you call it a door casing, they'll probably give you the same thing. But as with pretty much everything in the construction industry, nothing's really standardized. I wouldn't lose sleep over it. Trying to define terminology even locally is hard enough, never mind trying to do it on a global level. For now, folks, as per usual, be nice to one another, look after each other, and we shall see you next time. Tatty bye.